Anyway, thank you all for coming and uh, joining me tonight to look at this, uh, this project that I have spent a lot of time on. Uh, so the same uh, title here. Uh, I'm the speaker and I'm the head of this list of presenters, but I have to acknowledge my incredible colleagues who have been uh, instrumental in all of this coming together. Uh, so let me put my laser pointer on. Uh, starting with Sarah Campbell, a professor at, Belling, at uh, Western Washington University, Chris Bovey, who's from the University of Rhode Island, Sarah Sterling, a colleague of mine at PSU, uh, and, and Mike Ettenire, uh, we're all in this together. <clears throat> so uh, at European, uh, the, the contact period between Native Americans and Europeans, uh, uh, Elwha, excuse me, uh, Clallam peoples uh, lived in dozens of villages between uh, the Hoko River on the far west of, of uh, the Strait, Strait of Juan de Fuca over to Port Townsend. And then uh, several villages were across the Strait of Juan de Fuca over in the area uh, not far from Victoria. And uh, people had lived on this coastline for, uh, for thousands of years. Now, at the time of European contact, uh, again, these villages were known and were documented, and a particular site was documented uh, in Port Angeles, known as uh, Chiwitzen, uh, and it was seen in, in old uh, 1800s maps. And then T.T. Waterman, uh, who was visiting many places in the Pacific Northwest, uh, visited uh, Chiwitzen, and he noted it being inside this spit, uh, and he said it was a place of considerable importance in Aboriginal times. And this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the mentioning of this village and its importance to uh, Clallam people. And at this time, I also want to say that there's uh, a number of wonderful resources about uh, from the indigenous perspectives about uh, lifeways on the Olympic Peninsula, past, present, uh, and I draw a lot on um, uh, Jamie Valdez's uh, understanding of uh, the Clallam people's uh, occupation of Chiwitzen, and it's in this, this wonderful book edited by Jessely uh, Ray. So uh, to get a little more closely, a uh, little bit more close look at this base of Edith's Hook, uh, I, we look at a 1900 photograph that was taken uh, just uh, looking, looking west onto the Port Angeles Harbor. And I, I wanna direct your attention to all of these houses here, some of which are on stilts built out into this tidal uh, uh, lagoon. And lo very likely many of these were occupied by uh, Clallam people. Uh, I also wanna direct your gaze to this incredible spit that exists uh, and it, pers it continues out about uh, five and a half kilometers. And uh, you can see it also in the upper inset photograph uh, that is, was taken just a few years ago. And it just documents what a wonderful protected harbor uh, this spit provided. And it was, for that reason, uh, extremely uh, uh, popular and uh, dedicated to, uh, for European colonization because it provided safe, safe harbor. The other thing that just strikes me at looking at this photograph, though, is in a sense how vulnerable uh, this occupation was. That it looks like here we have the Strait of Juan de Fuca. We have uh, not too much above sea level, you know, places where people were living, and then we have the waters of the, of the harbor. So there's kind of a tension here. It seems very vulnerable, but I think people found it had so much to offer that it was worth putting down roots, as it were, and continued continuing to come back to this place over and over again. But I do want to direct your gaze to this uh, more recent photograph taken that, that really conveys how much the harbor has been developed uh, over the last 150 years. There's really not much shoreline at all that hasn't been either rip-wrapped or uh, a lot of overburden has been put over it. And here's a, a, a kind of that superposition of 
old shorelines like this red line here that is from the 1892 uh, tide line and it's superimposed over a, a fairly modern map and it it just shows and conveys in a very real way the scale of development that came with European uh, and Euro-American occupation of this area. This became a major uh, source of uh, timber and moving uh, timber out of the Olympic Peninsula uh, and a, just a very a center of, of Euro-American activity. And to emphasize, there's, there's really not much shoreline there that reflects a kind of indigenous time period. And it's really for that reason that, that this site uh, in a sense became obscure. Uh, it was not in people's minds in a very large way in the early 2000s when the Washington Department of Transportation decided to build a, a major dry dock uh, on the harbor. Uh, WashDOT needed that location. It needed a place to, to build these massive pontoons that are used to support floating docks in the Puget Sound area. And it basically fast-tracked a project to, to build this dry dock because it presumed that all of this harbor, uh, all the archaeology, all the heritage had been obliterated be through this last 150 years of, of uh, uh, Euro-American activity. And what was really a surprise was how much intact uh, materials were found uh, not very long after the bulldozers got, got active. And uh, here's a picture taken uh, during the time of while there was excavation going on, that is to build this dry dock. And then there's very careful excavation going on a few meters below uh, the, the grade that this uh, dry dock was being built into. So basically what happened was the project went from a monitoring phase to an active excavation when it became clear, not only were there uh, intact houses and midden and, and uh, important archeology, span but also uh, human remains and, and burials. And so for uh, uh, over a year, very careful excavation took place, bringing in a lot of tribal members who were working not only in excavation, but in the uh, screening areas and in the uh, lab to document these materials and dozens and dozens of archaeological technicians were hired to uh, open up and get samples of this important place that was going to essentially be destroyed in the context of this massive dry dock. Uh, in the context of this work, uh, there was the recovery of over uh, uh, I, I, I want to move something because I cannot see some of my materials here. Um, over 1,400 features were documented in all the kinds of features that exist, uh, post molds, wood posts, stains, hearths. Close to 65,000 artifacts were recovered. Harpoon points, adzes, etched stones, bifaces. Uh, over a million faunal remains were recovered. Uh, the project itself documented about 50 radiocarbon dates. And then when our project began, we obtained about 50 more. And uh, I won't say it's one of the most important sites in the Pacific Northwest, but it is one of the largest samples of houses, artifacts, and faunal regions in, uh, at least in coastal Washington and Oregon. Now, um, as I mentioned, uh, there were human remains found early on, and even though there was great care in removing them and reburying them, and, and that there was a lot of, of protocol attached to that, at, at some point there was just too many. And uh, through agreement between the state of Washington and the uh, Lower Elwha tribe, uh, there came to be a decision to stop this project, that it was just no more. Gary Locke, the, the governor of Oregon, came out and spoke very eloquently about it. Many, uh, Christine uh, Gregoire, you know, all the officials associated with the state of Washington senators came out. 
uh, and, and likened it to uh, a, a kind of cathedral, the Sistine Chapel. How can we keep building something in a place that had such importance to uh, indigenous people? So uh, the project stopped. And uh, I also wanted to call attention to a very uh, incredible, thoughtful book written by Linda Mapes, who was a long-term Seattle Times reporter. And she spent a lot of time with the tribe, with people in the uh, agencies, and, and really documents this process in a very thoughtful way. Frances Charles, the uh, tribal chairwoman at the time, who was still in that position, wrote a very thoughtful essay that, that highlights the kind of bittersweet uh, 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 views about this, the, the bitter part, the uh, remembrance of the colonialism and the hurt that happened when the tribe was removed to the reservation, but the sweetness of reconnecting to a place that had really gotten papered over, had gotten pushed aside. So the, the, this, this project, this dry dock project, got moved to a completely different place altogether. And then analysis of this massive amount of material uh, simply was uh, the, the documentation involved, just cataloging it basically, and putting it in the Burke Museum uh, up in Seattle. And uh, the Burke has been working with the tribe in the context of, of moving those materials uh, to a tribal location. But at the time our project began in the early 2000s, it was at the Burke Museum. So my colleagues and I were watching this unfold. We had visited this project uh, several times among us and were struck by its power and importance and were, uh, uh, you know, our, we were sad ourselves that nothing was coming of it. There was not gonna be uh, any analysis. And so uh, we being faunal analysts, we're bone people and there's some geoarcheologists among us too we decided that, that that would be our starting place to see what these uh, animal materials, these bones and shells had to tell us about the human story. Uh, these, these animal remains represent this important food. Certainly people ate a lot of plants as well, but these, these animals were essential to life. And because we know there are these histories of earthquakes in the area, there's evidence of climate change and local environmental change. We decided these animals would give us a window into not only their adaptation, but how people were responding to some of these uh, pretty uh, um, wide, wide and, and uh, significant changes that took place through time. So our starting questions were, can we detect ways that animals and people were affected by earthquakes? And we'll talk a little bit more about this, but tsunamis in particular, since that's, uh, we've got evidence for it at the site, and that's probably what was really uh, leaving its impact there. Also the formation of that spit, uh, Edith's hook, uh, we wanted to see what changes that affected uh, to the environment and then the human story. We wanted to see whether changes in ocean conditions or terrestrial uh, changes associated with climate, how that would affect animals and in turn people. Uh, we wanted to know where were people, what were people doing? Where were they fishing and hunting and gathering? And did that change through time? We were also very interested in household organization because as I mentioned, uh, there were people living there and they built houses on that place we could look at how households were negotiating or adapting to some of these changes and see whether they were doing it in sync together or were they operating more independently. We also wanted to contribute to the, the tribe's interest in their own educational programs and the development of uh, more uh, heritage, uh, their own, own museums for their own service, but also some of the tourism that they're trying to generate. And because that Port Angeles Harbor has been so degraded in the last 150 years, and many of the animals that we have remains for, uh, several of them are on the endangered species list, it, they provide an opportunity to potentially give us uh, understandings of what the animals were doing 150, 200, 3,000 years ago. And some of those insights might help us with some uh, issues related to conservation biology. 
So there you have it. You've got some starting questions, and I'm going to give you a sample of some of the things that we've learned through this uh, uh, pretty large scale project. So I've shown you the map a few times about where this location is at the base of, of Edith's Hook, this really long spit. Uh, and and it, I also want to call attention to this wonderful area outlined by the blue uh, uh, dotted line, that is what we call the Salish Sea now. And Chuitzen is right in the heart of that, this inland sea that is, uh, uh, and Chuitzen itself is kind of midway between the outer coast, which has its own uh, uh, resources and habitats, and the more protected waters of the uh, interior Puget Sound. Uh, the other thing that we know this area uh, supports is a lot of migratory animals, a lot of marine mammals move back and forth here. We know salmon does, but we know killer whales and, and other kinds of whales and, and, and uh, sea otter uh, move around in this area. It's herring. And so uh, Chuitzen is in a great place to intercept a lot of those kind of migratory creatures. But it also can really dispatch and, and, and have access to a lot of local uh, resources in this very deep harbor, uh, which supported different kinds of kelp and eelgrass habitat probably in the past. It also sits astride this nice broad uh, reef flat that would have been an incredible kelp forest uh, when this was a, a healthy environment. And then not too far beyond this reef flat is the very deep waters of the Strait of Juan de Fuca that have been glacially carved. They're, uh, I think, 200 meters deep. It's, a, it's really a, a deep area. And so that, though, allowed people who were very uh, canoe savvy to have access to very deep water fauna. Uh, and aside from that, we've got our terrestrial areas. We've got good elk and deer habitat in the uplands here. And we've got salmon that would have been migrating into the Elwha River, which is about uh, six miles to the west of Chuitzen. And then in the harbor itself, there were several local salmon streams. So as I mentioned many slides back, this, this location looks a little precarious, and in some ways it might be seen as that, but it was positioned so perfectly uh, relative to uh, these vastly different and rich habitats that it probably is one reason why people kept coming back there uh, after uh, these, these tsunamis kind of knocked them down. To give you a little background on the, the excavation and, and our sampling, um, and this is one reason why uh, we were attracted to working on this project. Uh, it was done very carefully and systematically, and shell middens and coastal sites are notoriously complicated for their stratigraphy. And I want to have you look at this uh, stratigraphy here, that is, these are these different layers of sediment that, that were deposited through the thousands of years of occupation. And basically, in the excavation, the researchers documented every microstrata. They had documented every distinctive colored layer and pulled it out separately, and then got one 10 liter bucket of all of those separate microstrata. And for each of those 10 liter buckets, they would have been taken over to this very almost industrial scale screening operation. And the buckets were put, the, the matrix inside that was put through graded mesh, uh, and uh, all of the fallen remains would have been brought out of those uh, different uh, size mesh screens. And this is really important for, for fish bones and certain shellfish, having this, this fine mesh. Uh, it's not as fine as window screen, but it's pretty little, and it allows you to uh, get good samples of, of small forage fish or fish that people were uh, getting like, like herring. The other very useful thing that is kind of uh, distinctive for uh, coastal sites or these big complicated uh, Northwest Coast sites is that all of these animals, all the bones that came out of one bucket were kept together and, and, and available for our study. And that way we could see how all of the animals together were responding to these various uh, external changes or social changes, social impacts, and what I'm trying to say is, is that in many of the sites in our is complicated, big old uh, coastal sites, sometimes you have the fish bones from this place, 
you have the bird bones from this place, the mammal you typically get from all over because there's not as many mammal bones, but you uh, don't always get the bird bones that are taken from the same place as these other types of animals. So that you can certainly say things about all of these animals and people using them, but you can't compare and contrast the animals together. You can't ask, were people using shellfish more here or men turning more to fish? Or when did birds really come into their own uh, relative to the use of these other animals? So I can't tell you how uh, the final analyst that I was, we were looking at this project and we said, we got to study this. So again, emphasizing this massive, massive site. And I, I might have gone over this too quickly early on, but each of those tiny little squares is a one by one meter. And, and each of those was excavated with the kind of care that I'm describing. It's just really uh, just pretty incredible, the scale of it. And we knew we couldn't look at everything, we couldn't do it all well. So we focused on one area, uh, area A, and then just chose some of these big blocks, these contiguous units that represented plank houses and midden where a lot of uh, trash and debris had been pitched. Um, and we focused on uh, certain blocks from that one area. And we also knew from some of the earlier radiocarbon dates that, that the, sites the site tended to be older away from the harbor and it got younger as you moved closer to the harbor's edge. So we definitely wanted to, to get samples from throughout that transect to, to be able to look at, at this important uh, change through time. But we certainly didn't look at everything, but we looked at a lot. <laughs> and I'll say that in addition to this uh, important faunal analysis, looking at the animal bones, we had to spend a lot of time looking at the, the, the geoarchaeology, the, the profiles, the, the sediment itself, to try to reconstruct the, 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 uh, how, that, how, how the site was uh, accumulated over time and how it changed over time. And that took a tremendous amount of, of effort. And to tell you the truth, that's one important piece and one contribution that anytime anyone wants to go back and work at this site, we have laid the groundwork for the analysis of the stone tools or the bone tools or anything because we have really mapped out the chronology of a really big, big kind of a big chunk of this archaeological site. But we got all those, we made our selections about what parts we wanted to look at. We went to the Burke Museum and we brought all these bones back to our labs. And then our, uh, under our supervision, uh, literally dozens of students started to, we started to work with them and, and give them a chance to work on this incredible project. And uh, uh, together we created the records that, that we have. And I thought that, you know, just to give you a picture of, of how, you know, the kind of the complexity of this site, and, and I decided I wanted to say what we found in one 10 liter bucket, and then I'll multiply it out to give you a picture of how it, you know, kind of sprangs out like a jack in the box. But in one bucket, there was uh, over, you know, five, 55, 5,600 specimens. You can see that the shell dominates with 4,600 fish, just a little over a thousand, and not so many bird and mammal bones. And that kind of makes sense. You know, birds are big, mammals are bigger, so you're not going to get as many of their bones in one 10 liter bucket. And I'll say that we knew that, that, that we were not going to get the same sample sizes using these buckets, so we did increase the number of buckets to study the birds and mammals to get more, uh, just to get a higher sample size. But still, that's a lot of stuff in one 10 liter bucket. And here's the kinds of animals we found in one 10 liter bucket. 13 different types of shellfish, 17 types of fish, three types of bird, one, one male bone, it was a deer. But you know, it's just amazing. Out of 14 bird bones, there were three types of birds. You know, what I'm getting at is that there's a lot of diversity that, that plays out in one bucket. It just reinforced to us how much people in this area knew their land, they knew their, their marine and, and uh, freshwater environments, and they uh, took advantage of that bounty. 
But to flesh out, those are just lots of names. What we really found in that one bucket was a lot of burrowing clams like Little Neck and, and uh, Macoma. We found a lot of mussel. We found a lot of sea urchin. We found a lot of herring, flatfish, sculpin, rockfish. And the, of the birds, we found murs, beautiful kind of offshore uh, aquatic bird. We found ducks, we found cormorants, and then we found that one deer bone. <laughs> but that's just one bucket. And we looked at over 100, excuse me, over 820 of them. And so I'm going to give you some results that, that are drawing on this uh, rich sample, but I wanted you to have a picture of what it comes from, what happens with one bucket, and how can we expand that out and think that we have a good sample of, of people and their relationship with animals. So to give you an overview of, of the, this animal bone record, uh, just of that sample that we studied, we had uh, over 1.2 million specimens, and certainly shell was the uh, lion's share with 1.1 million materials. Fish is an order of magnitude less, and again, the birds and the mammals are uh, uh, almost an order, or more than an order to of mag order of magnitude less than the fish. And as I mentioned, because of those lower numbers, we ended up using additional samples to uh, increase the, uh, the numbers of, of, uh, of those types so that we could uh, know that we were uh, getting representative samples of these types of animals. But the other thing I want to call your attention to is just the diversity. Uh, the, the genus, uh, there's 81 different genera. And the genus in, in Linnaean taxonomy is that the, the binomial nomenclature like Canis, uh, uh, familiaris, that's dog. So Canis is just the genus level. Uh, what I'm getting at is if we were, if I was to give you the species, it would almost be twice that. There's just so many different types of animals that were important to people or that, that people used it in, uh, and took advantage of. The other thing that I wanted to give you some practice looking at and thinking about is just a, a, a simple bar chart for each of those main animal groups to illustrate an important uh, characteristic of a lot of faunal, uh, a lot of animal bone studies. And that is, yes, there's a lot of different types of animals. Each of these is a separate uh, invertebrate or a shellfish family. But these green bars are indicating the relative proportion of them. And you can see that, that this, uh, the, what I'm getting at is that only a few shellfish dominate. And then there's many, many fewer uh, that are represented in these other, uh, other names. So it's dominated by the mussel and then the uh, uh, urchin and then these burrowing clams. And same with the fish, it's dominated by herring and then sculpin and then cod. Uh, and the bird, it's dominated by murs and then ducks and gulls. But these other ones are there, they're just not that common. And for the mammals, dominated by uh, elk and deer, and there's a lot of dog and northern fur seal and lots of other types of animals, but they, they were not the biggest uh, uh, ticket item in town. People were using a broad range of resources, but tending to focus on fewer ones. And I have a picture to kind of indicate the, the big ticket items for each of these main uh, groups of animals. Uh, just to, again, there's a lot of variety, but when it comes right down to it, some of them are a lot more, uh, were uh, targeted more than others. But you know, we got to look at animal pictures because <laughs> names don't mean anything and, and bones mean even less. So uh, I, we always want to put these pictures in our minds and think about these are the living creatures that people were engaging with. Now, the other important thing that we had to do was create uh, a time structure. We had to put these animal bones in a, in a chronology so that we could see how they were changing, how the animal use changed through time in response to earthquakes and climate and so forth. And based on all of these radiocarbon dates and the careful analysis of stratigraphy, uh, we created seven different time periods that range from about 150 years in duration to 450 years. But 
again, if you knew and had read many coastal uh, archaeological projects and looked at the time units people use, these are much finer than most of the time people get. And we, we wanted to have a more fine scale view so that we could see how people were responding to earthquakes. We didn't want them to be in a thousand year blocks because then it would be a very coarse grained uh, kind of, of uh, appreciation. But the other thing I wanted to say is, we know from the radiocarbon records that this site was originally occupied 2,700 years ago, but the sample of the, of the uh, village that we studied, we don't have any dates older than 2,100. So we, have a, we, we clipped off the, the, that earlier period. Now, just to you know, put your mind on, again, where is this coming from? This is one excavation unit. And to emphasize this microstratigraphic approach, each of these numbered uh, uh, catalog numbers, 3.20.1, 3.1.2, those were separate uh, uh, microstrata that were excavated. And then we got a bucket out of one of those. We got a bucket out of one of those. But then after uh, we brought all that information to the lab, we, we combined those microstrata into these larger chronologic zones. So CZ4, CZ5, CZ6. So, older and younger. And this particular unit, uh, the deepest part of it is about 1100 years old, and the more recent is about 300 years old. So it's always crazy to look at an excavation in the site and realize just how much time is represented. But because we have a lot of ra radiocarbon dates from throughout almost all of these units, we know that, that most of these, most parts of the site were uh, almost continuously occupied, except in the event of um, one of these earthquakes. So I'm going to show you just for a couple of minutes a more complicated picture, not to disturb you, but to give you, a, you know, I want you to wrap your mind around how hard it was to put this chronologic structure together. Okay, so bear with me. Just, you know, you can, you can put your hands over your eyes if you don't even want to look at it, but this is one, one uh, section of the uh, one block excavation, A4. Again, we were sampling that. And this red line is showing one, one um, profile through that part of the block. So let's just pretend that I am inside this excavation unit. Now, all this has been cleared out. I'm standing here and I'm looking at this wall of the excavation unit. So again, like that last picture, each of these refers to one of those microstrata that was very carefully documented in the field. And then in the lab, what we were having to do was, was reassemble the archeological site, put all of those microstrata together from each excavation unit, and then tying that with the many, many radiocarbon dates we have, which are indicated with these asterisks. Uh, we feel pretty confident that we have built an accurate chronology uh, for this, this archaeological site. So why is this important? So be thinking, each one of those buckets that we got, say from this strata, we know from Unit 25 that it belongs in CZ5. We know this strata belongs in CZ6. So you can be thinking we, we drew on a pretty elaborate database as well so that each of those buckets, each of those strata could be carefully and, and, and accurately and systematically put into one of those chronozones so that we could bring it all together and start uh, developing some you know, pretty important ideas about what happened at this place. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that this profile is actually through a cross section of a house, uh, which we had identified uh, distinctive floors like these, uh, the color purple, those were a floor of the house. Uh, the fill is this more tan color. Uh, this is another floor. And through uh, careful uh, comparisons with other Northwest Coast houses and the kind of textures associated with floors, and I'll say that in, the, in this area, 
Uh, floors were usually uh, just the, the earth. Sometimes mat was put down, but they weren't wood. Uh, so they would have been um, simply people who have walked on them, put mats down, and then maybe gone away for a while, put fill back on, and then another floor would accumulate. And again, just to uh, emphasize, this one house has occupation from over 1,300 years ago to about 200 years ago or 300 years ago. And one of the things that, that comes out of a project like this is just that longevity of households of people deciding this is where we're going to build, this is the house we're going to maintain, uh, and there's many social rules and, and so forth that go with those households. Not that all of those would have been maintained over that time period, but it just emphasizes this longevity. And I think uh, I, I want to emphasize that, as I will in a little bit, uh, in the context of tsunami events that would have come in and kind of knocked houses down, we have evidence that people were coming back and rebuilding and, and reusing these same places. So I want to just give you a couple of specific results as well, uh, that looking at the shellfish in particular, which are so tuned into the local coastal environment, uh, we could divide up all our shellfish into those that burrow in the, in the, um, in the sand and, and uh, kind of rocky areas like, like Little Neck and, and uh, uh, cockle and, and butter clams and you know all of those, horse clams, those are all indicated by uh, this group of, of critters. And then we have our rocky uh, invertebrates like mussels and uh, whelks and barnacles. And those are indicated by you know, these. I'm going to just go ahead and put these in here. And one of the things, and, and then we have uh, kelp-connected uh, uh, critters like sea urchin, which are so uh, committed to and, and thrive in kelp beds, as well as, um, although those, that's the main one associated with that kelp habitat. And one of the things that we found was in the early going, in the earliest occupation of our sampled area, it was a uh, a, a soft sediment. That's tended to be what people went out when they wanted invertebrates. They went out with their shovels and they dug up those burrowing clams. But then things started to shift and it became much more of a of a rocky intertidal with uh, mussels and barnacles and whelks being the, the dominant. And then that maintained its dominance uh, as we move towards the present with soft sediment coming in a little bit later. But the, uh, one of the things we start to pick up is the uh, kelp habitat. And so certain things were changing in that local environment that was promoting different types of, of shellfish and people were, were there to take advantage of those changes that were, uh, that were taking place. So just to give you a little picture of this major uh, habitat change that was happening from this 2100 years ago towards the present, I want to start here at the top. And again, this is just a reconstruction based on this geoarchaeology that we did, is that we have the Elwha River, which is draining out of the Olympic uh, rainforest, and a lot of sediment is coming out of that. And that is the main source of sediment that is being transported along the coastline. And through time, it's building up this hook. It's building, it's building, it's building it up. And then you can see, as we move later in time, that hook is getting longer and longer. And as that hook is getting longer, it's forcing some of the currents to turn and start to strip away that soft sediment that was nearby and uh, people were getting those burrowing clams from. And it's shifting that sediment so that it's building a little spit inside and towards the end of uh, the occupation, that's that little interior spit is joining up with Edith's hook and it's really created this, this tidal basin, this, this tidal uh, lake uh, that uh, drained and you know, was connected with this, uh, with this harbor, but it provided yet a new habitat. And so as these habitats were changing, different types of animals were coming in and, and, uh, and thriving and people were right there to take advantage of the changes as they were happening. Now, another thing that I wanna 
in addition to, if you haven't seen this before, and just think this is such a cool thing that we could do with this project, is to use that bucket sample that I mentioned. It's such a great volume. We know it's 10 liters, and we know how many things we've looked at. If you look at 820 buckets, we can very easily figure out, uh, in a sense, what the density is, how many shellfish you get for that uh, 8,200 8, uh, cubic, um, cubic meters of, um, uh, or the, the volume of those buckets. And then we can divide that by the amount of time represented for each of those chronozones. And we can get this thing called an accumulation rate that gives us an idea of how intensively people were using this landscape. We don't know whether this rate change, if it gets higher, does it mean there's more people or the same number of people that are simply spending more time there? We don't, we don't know that per se, but we get some measure of, of intensity of use. How much are people, how much time are people spending there? Or how much are they engaged with that particular landscape? And one of the things that we see with that is in the early phases, people were mainly there to get shellfish. There's certainly some of these other critters, the birds, the fish, the, the mammals, but it's really about the uh, invertebrates. But then as we move through time, the invertebrates, that, that's just part of what they're getting. And people are starting to really take advantage of a much wider uh, range of resources. And, um, and you can see that the overall accumulation rate kind of ebbs and flows, but in general, it's tending to get uh, higher as we get closer to the present. The other thing that we know is about uh, the time of CZ4, which is about 1300 years ago, that's when we have evidence that people are really starting to build houses there and uh, spend extended periods and multi-seasons. Um, but what's an interesting thing here is that we would expect there to be real differences in the fauna when you've got this more settled time. But in, in, in fact, what we see is this, the same kind of resources people are using uh, uh, exist before that plank house occupation and after. So we think that people were always spending a fair amount of time there and taking advantage of that bounty and uh, maybe just in, you know, investing more time in it and, and building houses there, perhaps connected to aspects of territoriality or some other thing. But, um, and I'll also have to say that there's a big part of that site that we didn't sample. So it's possible that there's plank house occupation that's earlier than what we have in that part of the site that we've studied. Now I wanna take you to this, this earthquake impacts. And, um, we all, you know, many of us know that that uh, in our world, we, we live in a place where uh, we could have these, these great earthquakes, these mega earthquakes. We know from uh, paleogeology, people looking at, at uh, uh, subsided landscapes along our coastlines, uh, documenting uh, tsunami sands, that basically over the last several thousand years, there's been many of these uh, mega earthquakes, like the one in Alaska in 64, that, that uh, Good Friday earthquake. And we just haven't had one at the time, uh, since the time of European contact, but we certainly have a lot of oral traditions from indigenous people. Uh, and then this, this, this paleogeology is absolutely demonstrating it. And we know that with these earthquakes, we had uh, not only we had uplifted landscapes, we had subsided landscapes, we had landslides, we had just major ground shaking, and, and then tsunamis. And uh, the uh, Ian Hutchinson and others who looked closely at, at the modeled uh, uh, tsunami, uh, the modeling of the likelihood for tsunamis in Port Angeles, that uh, in the event that a tsunami came through from one of these uh, cascade subduction earthquakes, and if it happened at a high tide, all of Port Angeles would be underwater. I mean, and again, that picture of the site at the base of, of the Edis Hook, it would have been extremely vulnerable to uh, an, an earth, a, a tsunami that was even at, at low tide. And uh, there's been at least full, full rupture events in the past 2,000 years, and then there's been some earthquakes that have been suggested 
from tsunami sands and different things that don't fall into this full rupture. And when I say that, that means from British Columbia down to uh, Northern California. But there's been some uh, uh, earthquakes and, and, and more local events, uh, including one that there's evidence for not far from Chuitzen. And so we think there was probably five earthquakes that, that, uh, and, and tsunami events that overtopped the Chuitzen project. And uh, just had to include this uh, beautiful picture from Japan uh, that showed one of these, you know, great tidal waves. And many of you know that there are these wonderful parallel connections between the North Pacific on our side and the North Pacific on the Asian side and, and how many of the earthquakes that happened here actually had tsunami events over there. And, you know, we're, we're all in this together being in the, this ring of fire. Now, um, the event that I really want us to look at in terms of the archaeology is one that doesn't fall into one of these full rupture ones, but the one that it, it, it fit very nicely in some uh, archaeological records that we found. Uh, and there was evidence for a tsunami in a salt marsh not too far from the Chuitzen site. So I just wanted to give you a picture of, again, those profiles. This is that the excavation unit that had to be, in a sense, reconstructed. And one of the things that we found um, uh, preceding the, the time that we knew one of these tsunamis had taken place was a series of planks that were, uh, that were identified in the original excavation. And those have been radiocarbon dated to before uh, this known uh, uh, tsunami event. And then after that was a uh, floor deposits and then fill deposits and so forth. So we have kind of in place the likelihood of a house being present. And then in a sense, it was knocked down uh, by one of these tsunami events. And another kind of way that we think we've, we've got this event here is that we have radiocarbon dates that occur during this CZ5, this deeper, older time period, and then some that are after it. But there's a gap of about 90 years, uh, you know, radiocarbon years between those two CZs, which would be the time when um, people were rebuilding or uh, maybe abandoning that site for a short period and, and, and not actively uh, leaving uh, deposits at that time. So we're kind of looking at this event happening between CZ5 and 6. And I'm just showing you one kind of evidence that we have. We've got things that in other, other project reports that support this, but I'm using this as my, uh, my break period. And I'm going to basically walk you through what we think uh, the impacts might have been of that one earthquake on this community. And I want to do it by looking at the uh, two of these plank houses that we have evidence for. And I call it the A1 and the A4 plank house. I know they had much richer names, <laughs> but from an archaeologist, you know, that's how we uh, designate these. But again, it's really cool because they're contemporaneous and they have occupations that are before that event and they're after that event. And the, que the question is then, how did these households respond to a tsunami? Uh, did they both persist? Did they both, uh, you know, they kind of got knocked down? Did they both, did the people come back to both of them? Did one of them grow uh, to be larger? Uh, how did they uh, deal with this? And did they do it in different ways? And the way that we approach this is by uh, thinking of the animal remains and how not only were the animals potentially affected by the uh, uh, tsunamis, and there's other aspects of the project that I, I address that and I don't really have time for that, <clears throat> but I want to focus our attention on more of this social stuff. And to get to that, I want us to be thinking that um, in, in Coast Salish and the people who lived in this area, uh, extended families tended to own resource patches. They owned clam beds, they owned salmon streams and duck nets. And they didn't own them like we think of Western ownership. They, they had what's sometimes called contingent uh, ownership. That is, 
they, they controlled access and they often granted access. They might have even loaned people nets, but different families kind of had control over that. And there was certainly a lot of sharing going on, but our question was how much sharing was going on? Were these two households working together uh, before the event? Were they working separately? And then how did that change after the earthquake? And so I want us to be thinking about this resource ownership that, that, that the, these, these families and these two houses, they could own the physical uh, patches, they could have the gear it takes to get those resources, they, have, they could own the knowledge, they could have the rituals. And uh, effectively what, what we were asking was, were these two households working together? Did they kind of own it together? Uh, uh, before and after the event and did that change or were they operating separately were they their own agents and and really operating independently we don't know we didn't have any expectations going into this but because of this micro scale uh, record that we had where we had this catastrophic event we could start to ask these questions and see what the answers would be so again, where did they fall before? Were they working together? Were they working separately? And how did that change after a tsunami? So a working assumption with this is that if households are sharing any of that stuff, if they're sharing access to the, to the physical place where the animals are, if they're sharing gear, if they're sharing knowledge, the fauna should be similar, okay? If it's all like we're all in this together, there shouldn't be any difference before the event or after the event for those two houses. <clears throat> and if that's the case, then we can measure that using just how similar are the animal bone records. We can, we can measure that. That's what, that's what we can do with our animal bones. And so that's in fact the kind of comparisons we made. So to kind of set you up in thinking about this, we have a before event, the A4 house and the A1 house, We've got their animal records there. We have an event, yucks, you know, let's knock down the houses. And then we have after. We can start to see how are these households, what, are, what kind of animals are they getting? Is that changing? What's going on there? And I'm going to take you through one example. I'm not going to do this for all of them, but I want to just show you and have you picture what it is I'm trying to get at here. Okay, we've got the CZ5, the before the event and the CZ6 after the event. And then what I've shown here are just a bar chart of the different types of, of bottom fish, like uh, sable fish or black, black cod, sometimes called ling cod, rock fish, all of those kind of fish I've looked at here. And one of the things that I'm struck by is how similar they are before the event. Just look at the size of these bars and the colors. There's some differences, but there's a lot of similarity. And then we have a tsunami, and then things are quite different. We have a lot more sable fish in the household A4, and a lot more uh, what we call staghorn sculpin uh, in, in household A1. And again, this is just for the bottom fish. So what I take from that, and again, just as my cartoon, is that before, they're very similar. So that seems like, there's not a lot of, of resource ownership and this is mine, this is yours. We're kind of working together there. But after the event, there are more separation. They're not, they're not as in, in sync in relation to the bottom fish. Now, again, I'm not gonna show you all of those, those bar charts. I'm just gonna show you kind of the summary information for the birds. And what's really striking about that is those two households had very different targets before and after the event, and that was maintained, that, that difference was maintained. So what I'm, what I'm saying is for that A4 house, MERS or these alcids, these slightly offshore birds, really dominated that A4 uh, house, and it was maintained. So whatever happened to disturb that household, they came back and they were still about getting those, those MERS. The A1 house had a much more duck orientation, okay? So the thing that you, and that was maintained over the event. So at least for the birds, you come away with this idea that these, these two households are working separately, you know, more autonomously before, and they, that did not change 
uh, after the uh, earthquake event. To go just to the, the, burrowing clan, the, the burrowing clans, we can see that uh, based on the before events, these households are working, looking at and going after very separate types of, of burrowing um, uh, shellfish. And I'm actually not sure the, the nature of those, of those habitat differences, but they're different enough that if you tend to go to one area, you're gonna, little net clams are the ones that you tend to just rake up. You don't even have to dig very much for those. And that's what the A4 household was getting before the event. Uh, and then after the event, there seemed to be a lot more sharing or a lot more uh, uh, communal or togetherness in the nature of that use. And one of the really interesting things to, that we're speculating about is from a global ethnographic uh, level about uh, shellfish use, it tends to be much, it tends to be very gendered and it tends to be a very female pursuit. So whatever is changing, it seems like it's changing in relation to what the, what the women are up to. And that before the event, they tend to be working separately and after they tend to be working together. Now, I'm gonna take you to one more. I'm gonna break it down because I think there's, there's some other, there's one other story that I wanna uh, try to uh, communicate. And uh, basically it's this idea of how are the households, are they growing in different ways? Are some of them getting bigger? Uh, getting more members after the event and, and less for the other one. And so each of these, these lettered areas simply represent a different animal group. So we got salmon, we got the rockfish, herring, bird, urchin, mussel, clam. And uh, then the colors represent the different, um, um, uh, what am I saying, the, the different households. So A1 is the light blue and excuse me, the, the light blue is A1 and the dark blue is A4. Uh, and then I've got to do that before and after. So it's, it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around all this, but let's just start with the left-hand side here. When we look at CZ5, in general, uh, for the salmon, the rockfish, the herring, and the bird, they're, they're kind of consistent. That is, they're, they're collecting the same kind of uh, amount of, of these, these kinds of resources. That is, they're in, they're, the intensity with which they're getting these is pretty similar. But after the earthquake, very different. That A4 household is going for these resources and the A1 is not getting nearly as many. So the, 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 the idea that we're getting from at least those types of animals is that the A4 household is growing uh, and has uh, maybe more members. It's, it's more intensively using those resources. But we get a different story for the shellfish. When we look at before in the CZ5, they're not together. That A1 household is having you know, much more intensive shellfish activity uh, and then, uh, than, the, than the A4 household. But then when you go after the event, they're much more in sync, much more consistent. And that reflects back on this other uh, point from just a previous slide, that for those burrowing clams, there seems to be a lot more togetherness for the, the two households after the event in relation to the shellfish. So all this is to say that the way people in these households were responding to this tsunami was complicated. You know, it wasn't monolithic and uh, both households came back, but they came back in very different ways and in very different combinations. And we think that that complexity may be part of this, the resilience that this uh, community had. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't just a one, one answer in any, in any sense. So that basically says what I'm trying to say here, that households were resilient, but they express it in different ways for different animal groups. And I, I, the second point here is that that indicates some kind of agency, that, that the people within these households are, 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 are working it. You know, it's not just some societal response to an environmental change. Because of our kind of micro look, we can, we can kind of simultaneously compare and contrast households and how they are going to be uh, uh, changing and responding uh, in the way that we did. And again, that, 
is uh, a power of a of a project that was has been excavated and cared for uh, and, and and documented in the way that we were able to do that. So again, not to belabor this, but just very different in the uh, nature of resource use and the degree of autonomy and more communal kind of activities. And uh, but the the you know one of the big stories is in the context of, of this event that we could look at in, in great detail, but all the other events that we have some evidence for. These communities are extremely resilient and they kept coming back to this place because it held such uh, uh, value from a, a resource point of view. And others, I'm sure, I mean, religion and ritual, it, it, it had power and people kept coming back to it. Now, uh, I wanna kind of emphasize that this archeological project began in controversy and the unintended discovery of the burials, it, it led to a tremendous amount of pain and grief uh, that the lower Elwha Clallam people are still dealing with. Uh, but at the same time, it fostered this kind of cultural connection with a very important place of theirs. And it, it renewed that and it, it, that those, those ties were extraordinary in the past and this archeology span and the rediscovery has brought it back again. And I'll also say that it created an opportunity for Port Angeles to confront their own history. And I don't need to go into a lot of details here because you know, it's a, it's a really big deal, but I've had conversations with the city planner. I know that the, the, the planning office recognized the, the, the pain that this caused and the opportunity for kind of a truth and reconciliation. And the planning, uh, some of the planning team has gone to the Cultural Resources Summit that the uh, folks in the state of Washington have to try to gain some insight about how heritage and history can help that town deal with a very painful past. Now, the Clallam people uh, call themselves, uh, and I'm not going to say the Salish word, but it's strong people. And this is so extraordinarily apt uh, as it's uh, supported by this archaeology, which just shows this enduring occupation with gaps. You know, they, people got knocked down, their houses got knocked down. I'm sure lives were lost. It's just the, the horrors of, of these kind of catastrophes. But the community was resilient. They kept coming back. And, um, uh, and then I'll also say that the, the, the project and the, the, the broader project as to what's happened in the last 20 years uh, supports this notion of resilience of the community in the face of colonialism. And I was talking with David Minnick about this earlier today. Uh, we have a lot that we're dealing with right now. Our own COVID virus, we've got the smoke on all these communities have been burned out in our region. We're, we're, we're dealing with a lot. And I will say that, that a project like this has reminded me of the resilience and the strength of indigenous people in our area. And if we're looking for inspiration, this is a good place to start. I'm just gonna say one more thing. Um, uh, again, tip of the iceberg in what I've shared, but a year and a half ago, we put together a special issue in the Journal of Archaeological Science reports that we funded to be freely access, completely open access. And so there's a lot more that if you wanna dig into this, you can look at and learn more about. And um, I'm working with people to try to bring more of these stories uh, to the public's attention. Uh, if you've got any questions at all, obviously ask them now, but uh, email me and I'll be delighted to talk to you more. So thank, oh, oh another big thing, acknowledgements. I wanna really thank the Lower Elwha Clallam Tribe for their support uh, through these many years. The National Science Foundation kept coming back and helping us as we needed uh, continuations and additional money here and there. All these students, uh, extraordinary helpers, uh, lots of uh, brainy uh, geoscientists in the earthquake realm. Uh, the, the Lynn Larson and Dennis Lewark were part of the, the company, Larson Anthropological Archaeological Services, that did the very careful work here, and we owe them a tremendous debt. 
uh, Washington Department of Transportation helped fund uh, some of the loan fees. The people from the Burt Museum were tremendous. Uh, Jenny Shaw identified all of our charcoal so that we could get annuals and, and get the finest uh, radiocarbon chronology we could. People helped with radiocarbon dating and uh, GIS and uh, databases and then just a lot of good friends and, and colleagues just helped us get to the finish line here. But as you know, there's not a finish line. <laughs> this project will never be done. Uh, and I thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Virginia. Um, I didn't see any questions come in, but I would like to encourage people to ask them now if they have them. Oh, we have a question. What is at this location currently? Okay, uh, very, I'm glad you asked that. I don't have a picture of it, but the, 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 the land, I know what, I'm going to get us out of the, um, the sharing, I think. Uh, the, the, the property that was that archaeological site is now under the stewardship of the Lower Elwha Clallam tribe. And they have a section of it that is part of the, the burial and the, the cemetery uh, where their ancestors were, were reburied. And there's uh, discussion about whether to put some kind of, of uh, museum or facility at that location or leave that as a, as a uh, just a, a kind of hallowed ground. I, I don't know what folks are thinking of doing, but right now, if you're in the Port Angeles area, you can go to the base of Edith's Hook and actually drive out on Edith's Hook. And as you make that turn, you would see a really big area that is behind um, hurricane fencing, and that is the, the site. All right, another question. Is there any evidence of the landscape being manipulated to better serve the village, for example, fish weirs? You know, we don't have any, any fish weirs. We didn't see them at this, you know, in this particular location. <clears throat> I think it's because it really is the village. You know, we weren't in some uh, outside area. Um, but I'll say that one thing that we found in terms of a landscape modification, there uh, was a place where several wooden stakes were uh, vertically placed as though they were uh, you know, creating a kind of terracing uh, along one of the, one of the embankments. Um, <clears throat> and there's other places where there was probably fill going into some of the, the, uh, the swales, some of the, the undulating landscape, filling it in to level it, uh, to make it more habitable. Uh, but not a, a fish weir per se, but kind of an irony here. I mean, the, the state of Washington looking for a place to build this big dry dock, they really couldn't find a place on the coast of Washington that wasn't going to have uh, important archaeology. And they found this place, and I, I, I'm thinking Grace Harbor, I, I might miss it, maybe someone in the group knows, but, but they found this place that they thought was not going to have any archaeology. And they dug, uh, and, and under about uh, 10 feet of fill, they found a fish weir. <laughs> and they were able to get samples of it and document it. And it was so deep that this, this historic fill really had protected this fish weir. So this dry dock wasn't going to uh, seriously disturb this, this uh, new find. But it's just, there's irony on top of irony. I mean. There was a lot of people that lived, let, continue to live in our area, and they've lived here for since time immemorial. And it is very hard to find a patch of land where you're not going to encounter uh, uh, coastal people. It's just not going to happen. All right, and I had a question actually on your uh, stratigraphy uh, slide that you had that had yeah. all the different um, deposition events. Yes. Um, so I noticed that it was all, I guess, um, like arbitrary labels. There was no actual depth label. Oh, okay. And so I was curious how far 
in order to get that time span, how far did you actually have to dig? How deep? So that's, thank you. Thank you, Paula. Um, I think most of the units were not more than a meter and a half, you know, four to five, um, maybe six feet sometimes down. It, it was not a really deep site. Um, I'd say most of it was a meter, a meter and a half. And, and so, um, uh, you know, it's one of those things where I, I, microstrata is a good definition of, I mean, some of those floors were not very thick and uh, you had to have pretty wise excavators troweling in order to not uh, clip and move into a, a different strata. So the other kind of approach they used was that, that open block where they would open a big area and start to excavate. And then they could see in the sidewalls what likely uh, microstrata they were going to encounter so they could anticipate it. Uh, but they had a lot of, of clever people spotted all around that project area so that they could uh, maintain that, 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 that collecting of microstrata. Well, Virginia, thank you very, very much. Well, it's my pleasure. It, it was great to be back at a meeting and to be <laughs> back in one of your lectures. So, <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but uh, well, it was good. I enjoyed it. No, no, no. But I, I really appreciate uh, OAS having me, and uh, I sure wish I could look out at an audience and go shake a lot of your hands and God do a couple of elbow bumps because <laughs> I. I I'm a very social person and I don't know, this is really killing me, but yeah. um, I wish you all the very best. We wish you the best as well. Yes, thank you. All right, so that concludes our meeting for the evening. Um, I would just kind of like to remind everyone that this was recorded and will be on the OAS YouTube channel again. And uh, we'd just like to thank Virginia one last oh, time. Oh, wait, well, Paula, I'm not meaning to get your business, but there were okay. a few questions in the chat. Oh, I missed those. <laughs> got talking to you and missed them. <laughs> what do we got? Oh, maybe some of these were private. Okay. Um, someone said, oh, no, no, you got the fish weirs. That was it. That was it. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. And any coring done. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, that's a, uh, I, I don't know how much deep kind of coring happened, but I know that coring was done ahead of the, uh, at, at different levels. It was definitely done early uh, when people were just trying to get an understanding of where the archaeological site was and, and whether there was any intact deposits left. And then it continued to be done but you know, coring devices are so small and, and limited. And to tell you the truth, there is archeology span along every part of that, that shoreline. Um, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't tend to find a place that you weren't gonna get midden or, or some record of, of archeology. span So uh, it's, a, it's a very well occupied uh, uh, landscape. Now someone else asked, and they did, it was a private question, but what were the typical sizes of the plank houses? You know, that's something that I, uh, I want to give you a good answer for, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm struggling here. And I want to say, it's, it, they're, they're smaller than the, than the, like the Cathlopodal plank house that many of you might have been out in. They, not on that scale. Uh, these houses were, were more in the, uh, I'm going to just write some numbers down, like four, like five meters long, five meters, maybe 10 meters, uh, like 30 feet by, by uh, 20 feet uh, and, and smaller, not like what we see on the lower Columbia or some of the houses that have been documented on Vancouver Island. So they're you know, more modest kind of house styles. And I think one of the things that comes out of, of looking um, at both at the archaeology and as well as the ethnography about houses is how variable uh, houses were uh, in, in Northwest Coast society. And um, not only from like the North Coast down to Oregon Coast, but just 
even within uh, the Salish Sea, just a lot of variability. And we're still trying to figure out what all that means and how much of that is because of uh, wealth and status and so forth, and how much of it relates to kind of seasonal type houses, less intensively occupied in the winter and that kind of thing. So there, I, I just wanted to answer another question. <laughs> Good, and because when you were doing that, another one came in. <laughs> oh, okay. So uh, were the earthquakes that were the cause of the tsunamis, have they been identified? So the, the way that that works is uh, people like uh, Brian Atwater, he's really the king of, of, the, of these mega earthquakes and the history of them. And, and he has spent, and others as well, uh, have basically cataloged uh, these earthquakes and have identified, again, for the last 2,000 years, four named ones that are uh, Y, uh, God, I'm gonna, they've been given different letters and I'm, I'm having a little mind burp, I can't remember what they are. But the way that this happens is, the, 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 the uh, geo, uh, you know, ge the geologists uh, basically get lots and lots of radiocarbon dates and they also do ge geo or dendrochronology and they, they basically date when they have a tsunami sand, they, they date uh, when they have a subsided landscape. And from the, the Northern California up to British Columbia, they, they date all of those kinds of events and they, they see when they happen. And they've, they found that they cluster at, at very uh, specific areas so that it seems that all of those subsided landscapes, tsunami sands, you know, dead trees, all of that was caused by a given big rupture. And so, um, so there exists this wonderful kind of alphabet of these mega earthquakes. And people like us, that archeologists, we come in, we're aware of that independent chronology. And we know within, you know, 100 or 150 years sometimes because people are getting even more specific radiocarbon dates, then we can look at events in the archaeology and see gaps in our record or see what might be a tsunami sand or a collapsed wall. And then we try to match it with that alphabet of, 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 uh, of earthquake events. And we don't know that, that our event exactly matches that one, but because of the coincidence, it, it, you know, you can start to make a case that, that it, it does link with that. But you can't, you know, it's really easy just to start matching things and not have independent data for it. So I think that one of the things that all of this kind of paleo seismology and, you know, using archaeology for this emphasizes is the kind of work that, um, uh, like Lauren Davis does, this extraordinary value of geoarchaeology and how you, you need to have uh, not only just general background in order to do it, but you have to have the right search images. You have to know what it is you're kind of looking for so that when you're working and excavating, you can recognize these unique characteristics because uh, they can be kind of subtle. Um, and it's just like, I can always plug geoarchaeology because it is so fundamental to uh, really better understanding the, the history of a site and people's use of a landscape. Uh, but it's especially critical if we're trying to look at how people were uh, uh, adapting to these major earthquake events. Um, so there was a question about um, the, uh, any species. So the one animal that we found um, that was really distinctive was this sable fish or black cod, which has rarely been found in Northwest Coast sites. And yet it's like our fourth most abundant fish species. And I don't know how many of you have had uh, black cod or sable fish. It's really good eating. It's really rich and fat. And um, we know from ethnography that it was very well regarded. And uh, there's, you know, talk about it having immediately being kind of a high status food. And uh, we're so struck by we have it and it's hardly ever been identified. And we're trying to, uh, you know, we've made some suggestions about what it is about that specific location, maybe that reef flat or the proximity of that, that kelp flat next to this really deep water made uh, this 
really uh, special for uh, black cod. Anyway, that was one. Um, the other one that we were pleased to see is sea otter. And uh, it is a, you know, a very important uh, charismatic animal in the Northwest. And, but it does not move, uh, it does not, it's just extremely rare in the Puget Sound. And we're kind of at the, the uh, easternmost point of the Salish Sea that you would tend to get it. And we, we did get it. And uh, it's a very special animal. Uh, both for the Clallam people and, you know, and all of us. Um, okay, so I'm going to say, where are the earthquakes? Okay, got that one, good, okay. Uh, yes, so the, the, can you provide an email? Okay, yes, just Virginia. Okay, someone has asked me privately. I'm just gonna say, if you have any questions, I have the simplest email ever. Virginia at PDX, like the International Airport, .edu. Just send me a question. I, I don't get enough emails right now. <laughs> oh, I'd really love to, to uh, talk with you about that. And um, uh, then the other question had to do with, uh, did the tsunami events change food resource habitats? You know, there's, um, there's subtle changes in the types of animals that were uh, found uh, before and after the event. And one of the things that I think probably had more impact was, uh, you know, the, the shellfish are going to be the most affected by a tsunami because they can't go anywhere. You know, they're, the, they're, they're sedentary. They are, they live in this place, you know, and if the kelp gets wiped out, you're not going to have habitat for a uh, sea urchin. Or if your sand gets stripped out, you're not going to have burrowing clam habitat. Whereas the birds and the marine mammals, I mean, and, uh, you know, obviously the tsunamis aren't going to affect elk and deer. So there's, some of these animals are really not going to be affected very well, uh, or as nearly as much as others. I, we, we made the case that for the fish, less about habitat impact and more about loss of gear or loss of canoes, uh, that if you didn't have uh, a canoe, which is a really big investment, and if that gets swept away, it might take some time to uh, re rebuild those uh, types of uh, uh, and very important gear so that you can get away from the shoreline and go off and get more deep water fish and so forth. So we saw some subtle changes related to the acquisition of animals um, and less about the, how the animals were affected themselves by these uh, events. Um, but the, the marine, excuse me, but the invertebrates tended to be the most affected and it, it absolutely makes sense. And all of that is very much supported by the uh, Good Friday, Alaska uh, mega earthquake from 1964, where um, there was just extraordinary effects of those, that major, major earthquake on, on that world up there. <clears throat> okay, now it really is it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So we've reached the end. And again, Virginia, thank you very, very much. And thank you for being our first for this brand new platform that we're trying out. So, well, it's been a blast. And I look forward to seeing folks next month for, uh, yes. for Lauren. Yep. So, Lauren's uh, meeting will be on October 6th. So uh, watch your emails for the invitation, and we hope to see everyone there. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thanks, Virginia. It was wonderful. Take good care, everybody. Stay well. Bye-bye.